I'm going to be in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. I want to share just a few minutes before we get into the actual message. <coughs> Is something along the lines of a theme that uh, I've been sharing from my own personal testimony and how I'm seeing things. And I don't necessarily mean for any of it to be so much as a criticism, but just an observation. And that is, I've been saying that within the church there is a movement, I'll say epidemic, that might not be the word to use, but I'll use it, in that we're swaying, swaying away from what's important, and the church is adding a lot of things and as I said in the last couple of weeks, I'm, I'm finding that there's a lot of stuff that they're doing and the, and the direction that the church is actually going in is not bringing life. And so when you don't see life being experienced, then it's not moving me because I'm looking for life. And if there's no life on something, it's not going to move me. And so basically we're just spinning our wheels going around the mountain until, I don't know, we wake up. But... I heard something this past week on the television as an example. They were saying the same thing, but the illustration that they use, I want to share. Before I get into the message, because I believe it might help, you see where I'm coming from in case I'm being mis misinterpreted in my observation, not so much as a being critical, and maybe it is. But years ago, Starbucks, making a lot of money as they were, thought they could make more money. And so what they tried to do was introduce sandwiches and things of that nature to the public, thinking that they would make more money with the coffee and introducing these breakfast sandwiches and other types of sandwiches, that they felt that they could make more money doing that. What happened was the opposite. They lost money. They weren't even making the money they used to make off of the coffee. And they couldn't figure out what the deal was. So, of course, they get their experts in there and they figure it out that when you walked into the place, they no longer smelled so much the aroma of the coffee, but the other stuff they were introducing. And they lost what they were originally about. And if you walk into a Starbucks, I mean, the aroma itself, if you like coffee, is very enticing. And you just want to hang out there because it's just that coffee smell, if you, if, if you like coffee. And so they cut the sandwiches out, went back to the original plan, and the sales went back up. And so I'm not in Starbucks a whole lot, so I don't even know if they, if they even have the sandwiches anymore or whatever or what they're doing. But that is a true story and an experiment that they themselves did and found. And so you use that as the example of the church doing the same thing in that in the inception of the church, where the Spirit's moving, it's all about Jesus, it's all about the Holy Spirit, it's all about the presence of God, it's all about truth. And what happens is we think we can do better, or we think we know better, and we start introducing programs, we start introducing other methods, other things that we think is going to entice the people to bring more people in. And we'll bring a band in, we'll bring a, uh, some speaker in, we'll bring something in, and, the, and, and they'll say it. It's to reach more people. So what are we, compromising Christ and the, and, and the really true vision of what the church is for these extra add-ons that we think these add-ons are going to bring more people. And then some of these churches will say it did bring more people. But let me ask the question. Are we trusting the Spirit to bring people in? Like the church used to, Paul never got into, you don't see anything in the Bible where it says, try new methods. Go do what the world is doing to bring the people in. Cannot the Spirit and the Word be enough as it was in the first century church? Or have we compromised and lost the aroma of the coffee by introducing all this other stuff? And yes, it's bringing some crowds in. People are excited over the sandwiches, but you've lost trace of the coffee. You've lost trace of the presence of God the, the, and, and the truth, the, the, the Word of God, the Spirit of God, because we have uh, compromised. And I think that's where the church is at. And so we got to get back. My thing 
has always been that. We've always we've got to get back to the simplicity of Christ, to the to the message of what the church is, is to train, to, to equip the saints for the work of service and then go out there and do it. But we, we, we've gone into entertainment. We've even um, introduced a lot of the psychology that's going on today, self-help motivation, to replace the spirit of grace that's supposed to be doing the work and the change. We've introduced principles and laws and things of that nature. And we're again, where's the aroma of the coffee? It's not there anymore. There's something else being... Um, you know, presented to the people. So I say that because I know that we've been talking about this in the last couple of weeks or so. And I, when I heard that illustration, true story of Starbucks, I felt they, they were even using it in the same way and for the same reason that I have this morning. So anyway, just wanted to throw that out there. I want to go to Luke chapter two, because again, this kind of threads it with the introduction. We're still looking at the beginning of the year. I can't get off the fact that this is the beginning of the year. I think there's some things God wants to say to us in preparation for your year, 2014. Normally I've gone on by now, but I still think there's some things to develop to get us prepared for 2014, the things that God wants to do for us. And we don't miss anything that God wants to accomplish in our lives this year. As you've known in the past years, I have been, like you, listening to messages, whether it's television or whatever, about the great things that God wants to do in your life, whether it's 2010, 2011, 2012. I've been through it all these last three or four years. And all the promises and all the great things that they told me was going to happen for me did not happen. And so it didn't mean, I'm not that smart, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out after about four or five years of pressure and temptation and trial and the following year these guys mimicking the same stuff just to move the crowd doesn't work for me anymore so I step back and I say okay Lord I know that what they're saying are actual promises they're not necessarily translating into my life they're not manifesting now I know what they would say to me well you didn't have faith or you didn't do this right. You didn't hold on. And I'm sure some of that may be true to some degree. But what's missing in these messages? Besides the fact that the great things that God wants to do in the promises, and you've probably already heard it because we're already, what? This, what is this, the second or third? What is this, the second Sunday? So, you know, you've already heard them. And, but what, I want to balance it out basically in this respect is, yes, I agree that there are great things that God wants to do, but it's not necessarily going to happen for you this year. Okay, you, you can't just compartmentalize a year and say that all this stuff is going to, this is going to be your year for all, well then what's going to happen the following year? If you get everything fulfilled this year, God's like, well, 2015, I guess I don't do anything. And then we miss the whole process anyway, because this is all about a process. This is a journey that we're on. We're not, if you do this, this is going to happen. You enter into utopia, and you don't need anything anymore. You don't need God. You don't need... No, it's a journey, and it's not, not everything's going to happen to us in this one year. In fact, it took Abraham 25 years to accomplish a son. That's not good news for us who are impatient, I guarantee you that. But if you look at it and say, look, it's not about just getting the son as much as is what God's trying to do through Abraham for other people besides himself with this son. And so it's a journey. Abraham had to learn some stuff before Isaac showed up. I mean, the fact that he would go to Egypt and leave the land of promise because of a famine and go down to Egypt. That wasn't that there, there was a flaw in Abraham's faith, in Abraham's life, his his um, conception or his perception of God that caused him to go down there to Egypt. So he had to go through that aspect of his life. I don't know how long that was, how long it took him to get there, how long he was there, how long it took him to get back before he came to the place that he left in the beginning, Canaan. I don't know how long that was. Was it a year, two years? It'd be interesting to find that out. But I don't know how long that was. It doesn't matter because it was time out. He took a wrong turn because... He didn't see things right. He didn't understand things right. There were still truths he needed to learn that got him off course. 
God didn't condemn him for it. God still walked with him and showed him things during that process before the promise came. I told you the hardest time is between promise given and promise fulfilled. You get the promise, that's great. You jump up and down. You get the promise fulfilled on the other end. That's fabulous. But the in-between, what I call the process, the journey, is where it gets tough because... This is where God's going to develop us and develop the promise as well. But I want to show you something because in this year, yes, there are, I don't know what promises. And I'm not going to tell you this is your year that you're going to enter into greatness. I think we're being developed into greatness. It's a big difference saying this is the, no, no. you got to see that I have, I am being, I'm being groomed for greatness for the last five years. So you're not telling me anything I, sh I shouldn't already know. Yeah, this could be a year that God opens a door. This could be a year that I get my breakthrough, but this is not my year of greatness. I'm being developed into greatness. If I tell you this is your year of greatness, that means you've arrived and there's no more greatness for you to accomplish. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm saying, no, you're being developed for greatness. A door may open to unveil that greatness, but you're never going to arrive because God's got greater things in 2015, 16, 17, or you may go through three years of more training before another open door. You're always being developed for greatness. So don't get caught up into this. This is your year for this, that, or the other. It could be, but it might not be. Here's the thing. What are you going to do when pressure comes to you? When these guys have set you up for utopia this year, for breakthrough, for greatness, and it doesn't happen, but the opposite happens, more crap, more pressure, more pain, more suffering. What do you do at that point? Because that can happen and has happened for me. I was I, I would watch these guys, listen to this great stuff, get my hopes up high for the year, and find out that year didn't pay off like they said that it would. In fact, what did I do with the pressure and the pain and the trial that I experienced that year? And what's funny is we we're a small church, and we've all after last week we've had two two families get hit just like that. Now, had I been up here saying, oh, this is your year, you can come, these people come back and say, this is my year, what, hell, what the hell happened? I came, I, I came out of the gate and got, and got smacked. Pressure came with me right out the gate for some people here. And so I know, we were, I, I know that we had a word from the Lord saying, okay, believe God for great things, but be prepared for the pressure. Be prepared for the trial because you're not going to get out of this year without some hits. But you got to learn how to hit, how to how to um, how to survive the hits. You got to learn how to deal with the hits. So look at with me in Luke chapter two because what we're going to talk. And believe me, this title I hate the title of what I titled this. My my spirit does not want to title this how to deal with pressure because I hate these how tos. But I'm learning that when I title my messages the way I want to title them, no one's going to listen to them when, they just, when they're scanning the, the website. He's like, what does that mean? But if I put a how-to on there, my God, they'll all want to know how to deal with pressure. I could have named this anything, but nobody would have listened to it. But no, we're going to, we're, we're going to see this how to deal with pressure. And you think I'm going to give you keys and secrets <laughs> and so everybody's going to listen to it thinking they're going to get a quick fix for their pressure. And that's not the case. Luke chapter 2. Verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went out to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. So she's pregnant during this taxation. She's pregnant. They have to leave where they are and go to Bethlehem to be taxed. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. So, get the picture, is that they're, I don't know if they're still in Egypt, but remember when Herod was going to kill all the kids and, they, and, and, and um, 
under three years of age or whatever. And so God told uh, Joseph to go to Egypt. And so they, they escape Herod's decree of, of killing babies. And so they're there for however long. I don't know if they moved into, into Galilee at this point, wherever they're at. Um, they make their way to Bethlehem because of this decree of taxation upon the people, everyone in his own city. Now the word tax, you can look at this word tax, and tax, any type of tax, whether it's money or something, a situation, this, this trial is very taxing to me. We use that term tax, taxing, this thing's taxing, or the actual tax of money that you got to come up with that maybe you didn't save, that's pressure. I want you to see the word tax this morning, using it from this story as pressure. Because April 15th is pressure with people who have not yet filed their taxes. They're under pressure to come up with their money or their, their um, to file, right? So see this as taxing, as pressure. It's, it's out of your comfort zone. Something's happening that's pressuring you. And if you're not careful, you'll think it's opposition when it really is a setup, a divine purpose of God. For instance, Mary and Joseph would have never gone to Bethlehem had not the decree of this tax be given to the peoples. They would have stayed there in their comfort zone where they were safe and secure. But because of this, for, this, this heathen king who wasn't hearing God, it's not like God gave him a vision, he's in the will of God, I want you to tax the people, that's taxing the people is not a blessing, is it? Is it a blessing every time our government raises our taxes? No. What's it do? It puts more pressure on our finances and causes us to spend differently or maybe have to get a second job. I don't know. But the fact is that Mary and Joseph would have not left the place of comfort if there wasn't a decree of tax put upon the people. Now, nobody during this time saw this tax because everybody got it as a blessing. No one's jumping up and down for joy when this decree went out. It was just like, oh God, here we go. And because they're not in their own city, they have to travel to get to where they're originally from to be taxed. So he can't be taxed in Egypt or Galilee or wherever he was. He had to make his way to this city where he came from. But here's the reason. It's prophesied in the Old Testament that Jesus would be born where? In Bethlehem. They would never got there. They didn't read that scripture. I mean, even Mary knowing this didn't, didn't say, oh, wait a minute, I'm carrying the Messiah. And I remember reading somewhere in the Old Testament, he's to be born in Bethlehem. Hey, Joseph, we've got, I'm almost ready to give birth here. We got to make it to Bethlehem. That's not, she ain't that smart or she is not that spiritual. It had to be because of this tax decreed by this particular guy, this king, that moved them. So in other words, what I want you to see is this tax, see it as pressure on Mary and Joseph to move them to the place where Jesus is going to be born. Does that make sense? Now, we see in the Bible that every man is being taxed here on, in, in his own city. Now, the purpose of pressure was to push, as I said, Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem because why? This baby can't be born anywhere else. God will not say, well, you know, they're weak in faith. No. It is decreed by God that Jesus is going to be born in Bethlehem. And so if he can't get them to move there by the Spirit, he's going to put pressure on them to get them where they're supposed to be. Why? This baby can't be born anywhere else. It's not an option. Right? It's got to be in Bethlehem. So what, what I want you to see here for your year of 2014 that whatever you're carrying, the vision, the dream, the word, whatever it is, can't be born anywhere but the place God wants it to be birthed. So in other words, God, you, 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 can't, come under, so you can't come under pressure and say, well, because of this thing, I'm going over here if God wants you where you are experiencing the pressure. Or if you're in your comfort zone and God wants you to get what he has for you, somewhere else, he's going to create pressure. The fact is, whatever it is you're carrying, which is the purpose and plan of God, your destiny, cannot. my destiny can't be fulfilled in any city in this country, right or wrong. 
If that's the case, we're all going to Florida or Arizona or Texas, somewhere south out of this cold weather. No, we realize my flesh wants to be down south, but I know that I can't fulfill destiny but in one place, wherever it is that place is. The placement of God in my life is key in giving birth to what it is that God has put within me or put within you. So you just can't get your promise anywhere. You just can't get your vision fulfilled anywhere. You've got to be, now listen, at the right place, at the right time, and surrounded by the right people, just like Mary and Joseph was. They could not get that thing accomplished in their life in Egypt. They came out of Egypt. Abraham couldn't get Isaac born in Egypt. So he had to go through the process of Egypt, learn what he had to learn, get back to the place of Canaan. Why? Because that's the place Isaac's going to be born. He's not going to be born in Egypt. He's going to be born in Canaan. And so what we've got to understand is the pressure you're experiencing right now may not be opposition. It may be God putting you where you need to be or teaching you. Not that God's putting that pressure on you to teach you, but he is stirring you because we're not seeing things the way we're supposed to see them. Sometimes we are in the flesh. We're in the carnality. We're in all kinds of situations where we're not hearing, we're not seeing, we're not sensing. And God's going to allow the pressure to come in order to move you, whether it's moving you geographically or moving you in, your, in the spirit realm to a higher place, a higher dimension for greater glory in your life. The pressure is to get you to maybe get something you wouldn't have got had you stayed in your comfort zone. And you know this to be true, that many times we, we, we receive a blessing because the pressure was on that caused us to seek God in a greater way than what we would have sought Him while things were going great. I mean, some of my greatest revelations was because the stinking pressure of life was so bearing down upon me that made me say, no, I'm not, and rise up and grab a hold of God maybe in a way I wouldn't have grabbed a hold of Him had the pressure not been there. So without pressure, listen, literally, figuratively and literally, without pressure, a baby can't be born. Because what's the doctor say to the woman? Push. Push. What she, she's putting pressure on that area of her body to bring forth this baby. So it's not... It's, it's, believe me, I can't speak from experience, but when they, when they put that woman in the hospital and they put her in that bed... She's not sitting there sipping tea and, you know, with a, or, or a mixed drink with an umbrella in it and kicking back with a cigarette and hanging out till this thing just comes. It's not a vacation. It's not something that she's going to enjoy. It's, it, it's, it's, it's painful. And, it's, and there's a lot of suffering involved. So understand that if a baby can't be born without pressure, what you're carrying... Whatever it is God's purpose and plan for you, the blueprint that God has for you is going to involve some type of pressure in order to bring it forth. So without pressure, that which is in you cannot come out of you. It's pressure that pushes you from where you are to where, you have, where you've got to be. Pressure then becomes the agent driving us to our destination. So we've got to quit looking at it as our enemy, but as something that God can use or is using Maybe sometimes he even engineered it because he knows no other way he's going to get you to point A to point B without putting some type of pressure on you. And it's really not God doing it. It's God just, pressure's going to come on you whether God is God or God is not God. Because of this life in which we live is not a utopia, so there's, there's pressure out there to be found. Right? It's coming your way whether you like it or not. And God says because... I'm, God is not engineering this pressure because the pressure is due to sin in the world. So God didn't bring sin into this world. Man did. So the pressure is man-made from the enemy. And God says, I can't do nothing about it because I allowed it to happen. But I am going to use it for my glory. And I'll engineer it. I'll orchestrate it. I'll do it. I'm not the originator of it, but it's here and it's on you. And I'm going to use it for my glory. 
to get you to point A to point B or to get you to get into a deeper level with God. Like I said, this whole year I think is going to be God calling people deep on, under deep and it's going to be pressure that makes you go deeper and not into the more shallow Christianity that we're experiencing today. So what you are carrying, the dream, the vision, the blueprint for your life um, is going to cause you to see this pressure differently. And Because why, 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 if you see this pressure as an enemy, do you know what can happen? You'll abort the promise. You'll get so ticked off at God because of this pressure, where these men have set you up for great things to happen in your life this year, and those things aren't hap happening because of the pressure that's on us, we say, well, this pressure, this, is God, this isn't happening. This pressure is coming at me. I'm supposed to be getting promises, not pressure. I'm supposed to be getting promises, not more pain and suffering. And what can happen is, if you don't understand the purpose of pressure, is that you will let loose of the promise, get offended at God, then definitely go down to Egypt like Abraham did and go somewhere because of a famine. See, when God called Abraham to the land of Canaan, he never mentioned the famine. He didn't say, now I've got a land of promise flowing with milk and honey, and it's going to be yours, but there's going to be a famine. And what I want you to know is I want you to stay there during this famine because I'm going to take care of you. Then he would have understood. But God never told him about the pressure he was going into because he wanted him to trust in the promise over the pressure. And so what you're experiencing today, you've got to say, wait a minute, just because I'm going through some tough times doesn't mean that God's given up on me or that the promise isn't going to happen or that the process is all now skewed because of this pressure. No. In fact, it is part of birthing this thing. Nobody wants it, but it's there. No woman wants to sit in that delivery room and experience the pain and agony and pushing that she's got to go through, but it's part of life and pressure is part of trial, pain, suffering. It's part of our lives. And we need to see that God can use it for his glory and not, not see it as, as it. And even if it is from the enemy, I've got a promise of God that God can take anything the devil throws at me through faith and entrusting myself to God that no matter what the devil throws at me, it's going to work out for good. So there's no depression at this point then. There's no discouragement. You just buckle up, you know, get, get your faith, step out in faith and hold on. And endure what it is that you're going through. Because it's through faith and endurance, the Bible says. Faith and endurance. Faith or patience. Patience means endurance. Faith and patience that we inherit the promises of God. So it's through faith and pressure, Hebrews tells us, that we inherit the promises of God. You don't inherit the promise without pressure. Do you understand that? So what they're telling you this year is you're going to get all these promises, but they're not going to tell you that you've got to push that you've got to push to birth those promises. They're not just going to come easy, but it's going to be through some type of pain and suffering because we would never ever believe and trust God if it wasn't. Uh, someone, I, I can't remember exactly how this guy said this. I heard one time. What qualifies us to receive the promise is that there's a need. First of all, if there's no need, then I don't need a promise. And therefore, because we're all in some type of pain and suffering, pressure, we all qualify for all the promises of God. Now, what's this, what, 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 what can be this pressure? I don't hope that you don't get none of this, but this is what I'm talking about when I say when the pressure comes. It could be a job loss. All of a sudden, you're making good money, and boom, bam, you got, you're jobless, and you can't find a job. And all of a sudden, your finances go to hell in a handbasket, and now... You're, you're in financial devastation looking at some type of a bankruptcy. That's pressure. Right? A divorce. You thought you were going to live the rest of your life with this woman. And boom, she ups and leaves you, or he ups and leaves you. And now your whole life is disoriented. You're disconnected. You're displaced now. You don't know what you're supposed to do. Your life is starting over again. you got to create a new normal. And, all, and I'm telling you, all of a sudden, that's pressure. Right? Or a death of a loved one. Maybe it's not divorce. Maybe it's death. And now you find yourself alone because of the death of that person. And so tell me that's not displacement 
That's now your whole life changes. That's not pressure put on you. I mean, these events take place in the lives of people every single day. If we don't prepare people for this kind of pressure, they're going to be devastated because they're going to understand the pressure is part of the process of God getting you to, from A to B. It's not that God killed that woman. not that God took that guy from you. It's life. But God says, I'll use it to get you where I want you because he who began a good work is going to finish it. Yes. The pressure is not going to keep God from putting you in purpose and destiny. In fact, he'll say, yeah, the devil meant that for evil, but I'm going to turn it around for good. So the pressure is not devastating me, although I'll feel the pain and, 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 and suffer from it. But my faith in God who says, I'll turn this thing around can get me still on my purpose and destiny. So when I understand that God, Jesus, who be, he who began a good work will bring it to completion, tells me that no matter what the enemy throws at me or what people do to me, whether it's my own wife or my own church or whatever, it's not taking me out of the purposes and plans of God. It may be a setback. It may knock me back. It may knock the air out of me. I may have to regroup for a couple weeks or a couple months. But I'm holding on because I'll get to where I'm going. Because nothing, according to Psalms 33, nothing can thwart the purposes and plans of God. So, I know, and I told you this last week, we know of people, when the pressure came on them, they folded and, and God says, I don't, that's, not, that's not the purpose for pressure, is to get you to fold or to get you into depression or to get you into skirt. I want you to see that take this pressure, this pain, this suffering, because it's, I'm taking you somewhere through it. How fast is, if, I, I've never known God, I get hit, I've never known God very often to take it out within the 24-hour period that it came in. I mean, as quick as it came, it don't leave that quick. Not that it can't, but normally it doesn't. It's like, man, this thing's in my face now. It's breathing down my neck. And it, it may came within 24 hours, but it's going to take 24 months to get, up, to, to get through it. That's just how life is. If you don't believe that, why didn't Jesus just rebuke the storm before the storm came? Why not, Jesus? You, you knew God knows all things. Did God not know there was going to be a storm when he said, get into the boat and go to the other side? I mean, would you rather have Jesus as your weather forecaster or the weather channel? Huh? Well, Jesus is like our meteorologists. They can't predict the weather. Because he didn't know that storm was coming, did he? God knew. And yet he still told Jesus, his son, to get in the boat and go to the other side. God knowing full well there was a storm, pressure was coming. Isn't the storm as a result of what? Pressure, cold, heat coming together, producing tornadoes. That's pressure. So they were experiencing hurricane, the, the literal Greek is hurricane winds. So they knew they were dead. So they go to Jesus and he's sleeping in the midst of a storm. Now watch this. Listen carefully. Do you know why he was able to sleep in the midst of that storm? In the midst of pressure? Be yeah, well, here's the, here's, the, here's the ticket. Here's the key right here. Although Jesus was, in, was, was experiencing a physical storm on the outside, but what caused him to sleep was he had no storm on the inside. These guys let the storm on the outside produce a storm on the inside, and they folded like a cheap what? Suit. I don't know. Like a yeah. I mean, they buckled under the pressure right off the bat. They threw the water out a few times, and that was it. We're done. We're dead men. Jesus, in the storm, outwardly, was able to endure and go to sleep because he had, either he had no storm on the inside. He was in perfect peace and tranquility in relationship to the Father, and he knew he was going to the other side regardless what life threw at him, what pressure he experienced. See, that's what I want you to see. Don't fold under the pressure, see it as part of getting you to the other side. Or, or, or in this case, it exposed the lack of faith in the disciples. And see, pressure is, this process between promise given and promise fulfilled is to show us things about ourselves. These guys had probably cast out demons, but they've never ever controlled weather. They never knew they could do that. 
That's why they got rebuked, which Jesus said, you could have done this yourself. I could have stayed asleep. See, they never, ever had an occasion to rebuke weather. So if the pressure never came, they would have never knew that they could do this kind of stuff. See, what I'm saying is, and I'll, I'll probably say this again at the end of the message, but let me just say it because it's, it fits right now, is that one of the reasons why God allows us to go through these things because things come out of us we didn't know it was there. I didn't know I had that kind of faith. Or I didn't know that, man, I, I didn't realize I could have done something. Or the opposite. Man, I didn't realize what a jerk I was until that pressure came on me. All right, there's some deep-seated things in me i got to take care of. Right? I mean, if pressure comes on you and you beat your wife and you kick the dog and throw the kids up against the wall, we got a problem here. And thank God the pressure came. You would have never known you had that problem. Huh? See, God's going after truth within us. And we don't really want truth. If you say, God, try me and see if there's any wrong in me like David did, man, I don't know if I want to pray that. I know there's wrong in me. Don't let me see it. I mean, here's a guy who thinks his crap doesn't stink. He's a religious freak. And all of a sudden, some girl shows up at the wrong place at the wrong time, and he has an adulterous affair, and now he didn't know that was even in him. Now, did God cause that? No. God definitely did not cause that. Could God stop that woman from being at the wrong place at the wrong time? Absolutely. He could have stopped her. He stopped Abimelech from having sex with Sarah, Abraham's wife, because Abimelech didn't even know it was his, his wife. He told her it was his sister. But he stopped the man with a dream. So I know God can intervene and stop things, but he's like, why would I let this man con continue with adultery in his heart? He doesn't know in his head what's in his heart. He's this far from, from knowing what it, what's in his head from his heart. And God said, I'm going to let this happen because I don't want him to walk around for the next 50 years lusting after women because he doesn't think his stuff doesn't stink. I'm telling you, when pressure comes on, it reveals good the bad and the ugly. And God is not afraid. Because he sees your heart every day. He, you don't have to commit the adultery for him to know you have an adulterous spirit on you. Huh? If a guy goes around all the time, he's a business guy, he travels, and all he does is sport with waitresses. Sooner or later, some waitress is going to take him up on it. And he's going to find himself, oh, I was just innocent. Was it innocent? How'd you end up in bed with her if that was innocent? See, nobody wants to hear stuff like that because you know what you want to hear? That it's going to be a great year for you this year. You're not going to sin. You're not going to do anything wrong. There will be no pressure. Hell, we are in the millennium. And we're not. This is the real world. And you're in flesh. You got Understand, you are chiefest of sinner, as Paul was. And that this whole thing, pressure is going to bring out the good, the bad, and the ugly. And if you don't like it, then go like an ostrich, stick your head in that sand and hope for the best. But you're going to be devastated if you're not going to be walking in truth. This is all about truth. This is to get you through 2014. I'm tired of looking back over my years and going, what was it all about? Because I didn't have truth. I didn't have a revelation of all this. I got set up by these prosperity preachers of how great it's going to be. It didn't get great. And I got offended at God rather than realize there's a skewed message out there that's not balanced. Does that make sense? Yes. So this child is not going to be born anywhere but in Bethlehem. And the only way to get them hit there was the decree, the tax, which is pressure. And pressure is not going to kill you. It's not going to destroy you because God said he won't let anything happen to us that will take us down, but he'll always provide a way of escape. So you're being set. Look at pressure as part of the process of setting you up to give birth to something greater, taking at least if not physically but taking you to a greater dimension of glory and anointing for upgrade bigger and better because that's what God's always doing he's always increasing us he's always growing us the outer man's decaying but the inner man's being renewed now you've got to be now here, here's a fact you cannot from what this story is in Luke 2 you cannot get the promise and you can't give birth to just anything anyone or any place at any time you've got to be at the right place at the right time with the right people in the right timing because God's all about timing and pressure will secure that to happen so it's what I call the providence of God pressure is the providence of God whether God's engineering it orchestrating it or use or it's the devil and God's using it God will always 
use the pressure because it's part of the process to manifest his best in your life. Now here's the thing. People fear this process. Because this is not a message that you're going to go out and go, woo, utopia. You're not, I can't, you can't do that with this message. See, I watch Joe Osteen and get done watching 30 minutes of him and think my life is going to be a, a bed of roses. You know that. That guy is never going to tell you about pain, suffering, devastation, because that doesn't sell. You don't walk out going, that was such a wonderful message. But you find yourself in the hospital in an emergency room and your spouse is dying. Where does that come into play? Come on. There is real, maybe we're all living in a bubble, a religious bubble. But I'm telling you, there's hell out there. It doesn't always go our way. And I'm, I'm living proof of that in, in many ways for the last three to four or five years. And I'm telling you that I can either get offended at God because I'm being set up for devastation by these people telling me, peace, peace, peace. I'm experiencing war, war, war. So I'm thinking, what's going on? The, or I get, well, it's me. I'm just not worthy. And I get into that mode. Or God doesn't love me. I get into that mode. Or God doesn't exist. Or God's not... And all of these emotions are hitting you for 12 months because you can't figure out why he, for 30 minutes, the first of the year, he told me I was going to have a good plans of welfare, not calamity, to give me a future and a hope, and I'm having a calamity. Huh? So where's the balance at? Either the Bible's wrong or we're, we're, we don't have the right lens on to interpret life yet through the Bible. Now go to Jeremiah 18. Jeremiah 18 verse 1 says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house. And there I will cause there thee to hear my words. Now he says, oh, we've taught on this before. It doesn't matter. I can teach on the potter's house every week and it ain't going to take you off his will. you got to understand this thing that he's going to show Jeremiah never ever changes in your life. And you've got to always keep this thread. Somewhere keep this message this illustration of Jeremiah 18, keep it some way in your spirit because it's always happening. You're never off the will of life. You're off this will when you get to heaven. Now this is what he says to him. Go down there and hear my words. Jeremiah 18. Then I went down to the potter's house and behold, he wrought a work on the wheel. Now he who began a good work will bring it to completions. I think that's Philippians 1.6. So right there tells me, he who began a good work will bring it to completion. When's it completed? When is the work God began with you? When's it completed? Think about the day you got born. Born again. Not born, but born again. Now that's when he began the good work. When's it going to be brought to completion according to Philippians 1.6? <clears throat> when you die. Not in 2014. You're not going to get your work completed in 2014 as these guys make it sound like all greatness is going to happen for you. And all, no more wars, no more troubles. No. Completion is when the day you die. So that means, watch, when I went down to the potter's house and behold, he wrought a work on the wheel. So as long as I'm alive, he's working on me, right or wrong. Which means I'm on this will. What is will? Will is the providence of life. It's life happening to you. The good, the bad, and the ugly. That's the will. When you go home and crap happens, you're on the will. You understand that? Now watch this. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the will. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred. That's that, I know that's me. I'm marred. And I ain't perfect. In the hand of the potter. So I'm in the hand of the potter. I may be on the wheel. Life's happening to me. But where am I at? My life is hidden in him. I'm in his hands. Because he's working on me. I'm not alone in this thing. I'm with him. I'm in him. He's in me. I'm in his hands. And so, I'm, so the, the clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So that he made it again into another vessel. And there's your sanctification. As seemed good to who? You? The clay? The potter. So that means God's in... You don't even have a say. 
And you have you you know my my saying. I've said this a million times since the 90s. The clay has no say. The potter does. So you can't go telling God what he should do, what he shouldn't do, because that clay can't say, I don't want you molding me this way. I don't want to be here. I want to be over there. I don't want you doing this. I want you doing what you're doing in that guy's life. You, the, the clay, has, you've got to just embrace the things that God is doing in your life because that's God molding you. That's you on your will, you on your individual will, in your individual life, in the hands of the potter. So the clay has no say. And it's, and it's whatever seemed best to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter in the clay? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. And we go to Hebrews 13 and see where God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I will never let loose my grip from you, the Amplified says. He says, I will never, never, never let loose my grip from you. That means you're always in his hands. And as long as you're in his hands, what's he doing? He's working on the vessel, which is you. That seems best for him, not what's best for you. Now, your flesh has dreams and visions of what you'd like to see your life evolve into. But it may not necessarily be what God wants. And so there comes that crucible, that pressure that's saying, I don't want to be here. I don't want to experience that. But this is where you're at. And, but don't get discouraged because it's that process that people fear that's going to birth where you're supposed to eventually be. I don't want you to see the pressure as anything being other than something that's going to help you give birth. Maybe not today. I've gone through pressure for the last three to four years and have many times wanted to give up. But I have to understand that the three years of pressure is giving birth to something. And the greater the pressure, the greater the testimony. The greater the trial, the greater the testimony. So my, my hope is this. God, you must be setting me up for some hellacious blessing. Hmm? Because how much longer can this go on? How much more pressure? How much more pain? How much more suffering? And I know you're not relaxing your grip on me. And I know that all the promises are yes and amen to me. So you're never going to fail me. You're never going to leave me. Cast your cares on the Lord. He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. I've been young. I've been old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or receive bacon bread. God is not going to forsake me. But he's going to be faithful to his work of me on the will of life. I'm in his hands on that will. Now, the, now watch this. The, the potter has control over the speed of that wheel. You ever seen them? They, I don't know what, what they, it's, they do something with their feet, make that wheel turn. And if he moves faster, the wheel turns faster. If he moves slower, the wheel turns slower. So this is what I call the timing of God, which is something else we've got to watch for. It's the timing that's within this pressure. So some have let the pressure destroy their hopes and dreams, or they've let time keep them from holding on. Maybe too much time has elapsed between promise given and promise fulfilled. So God's going to do something here. Now watch this. Every dream, I want, I'm going to say this slow because I'm closing this thing out. Every dream and every vision, every blueprint, every purpose God has for you that's in you is for an appointed time. You know that, right? These things will be tried and time will be the thing that tries it. Time. I hate time. I hate waiting. But it's the very thing that's going to try that thing because it's appointed by God. Time has a purpose. Here's the question you keep asking God. I know you do. How much longer? <laughs> now you're talking to him about time at this point. But you don't understand. I don't understand. I hope we do after today. That time is what's trying. But see, God is not a God of time. He's an eternity. Right? right. Time is for us. God is not a God of time. God is a God of timing. Right place at the right time. Season. God is about timing. He's not a God of time. 
He's a God of timing. And you've got to understand that during this process, see time as the process, you on the wheel, Him speaking, moving, doing all that He does, getting you ready for that thing He has for you. You're on the wheel being molded and shaped. And, and when, because God's about timing, you, he, you're not on that wheel because there's nothing else to do. You're on that wheel because He knows time is approaching you rapidly in order for you to give birth to that thing that He's got put in you. And until that time happens, He's molding and shaping you, getting you ready for the thing you're going to give birth to. woman's got nine months to get ready. Physically, spiritually, emotionally, for that baby. She's got nine months to get the house ready, to get a room ready, all that. It just doesn't happen. Can you imagine having sex with a guy and then tomorrow you're giving birth? There's no time, there's no preparation, is there? She doesn't have nine months to mature, nine months to study, nine months to go to classes, nine months to figure this thing out, to get her life ready. God gives the woman nine months to prepare for what's coming, right or wrong. And so you're going through that same time. You're carrying a promise. You're carrying a vision. You're carrying God's blueprint for your life that maybe not has yet manifested. Some of it has, but a lot of it has in the past. But you're still marching forward to the future. And there's so much more God wants to increase and do in your life and upgrade, take you to bigger and better places, greater dimensions of glory and all that, deep call on the deep. But while He's molding you, He's preparing you for that time that you give birth. If he, lets you, if he lets you give birth prematurely, what happens to a baby when, it, when, it's, when, it's, um, when the mother gives birth prematurely? In the old days, it died. Now they can put it on a machine. I mean, a little tiny. The, the baby just fits in the hand. And they can, they can keep it till it grows and, and be able to sustain itself. Um, but even that, sometimes they can't sustain the life of the child if it's born prematurely. If you want something so bad that you refuse the process and God says, oh, you know what, I'm going to give you that one, you'll screw it up because you ain't ready for it. That's what I call the process. I mean, I hate time, but I, I can understand there's a reason for the time. Time is going to test and try this thing and mature me and prepare me. And so let the pressure be something that teaches you, not something that causes you to fold but teaches you, in fact, let the pressure unfold you. Where you're blooming, that's causing the pressure's causing you to bloom and be better, not be bitter. Does that make sense? So God's going to take the time to educate you. And she, Jesus said to his disciples, I've got many, many things to say to you, but you're not able to handle it. That, that, what do you mean I'm not able to handle it? Tell me now, I can handle it. Now, if I give you this truth, you don't even, you won't even know what to do with it. It'll go right over your head. So I'm not even going to go there and confuse you. Why? Because there had to be more of a process that these disciples had to go through. Trials, ups and downs of life to learn valuable lessons from the Word by what they're going through. You've got to understand that Bible is not just going to unfold. It's going to be unfold as you go through your journey. Because one scripture may not mean nothing to you where you're at. But a year from now, and the hell you're going through, that scripture is what's going to sustain you through that thing that you're going to be going through is going to make you a better person and prepare you for what God has for you in the future. And that's what the, you know, the Bible is your, is, is your GPS, your map to, for the journey of life. It's not something just to go to Bible school and study theology and get your doctrines. It's to help you where you're at right now because it's going to prepare you for where you're going. So let time educate you. Let time challenge you about what's inside you, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. But let me ask you something. Is the delivery, going back to the analogy of a mother giving birth to a child, is it about the mother or is it about the child? What's the birthing about? Is it, is it, is it about the mother or is it about the child? What are they concerned about? Now, I know they're concerned about both because you know, there can be complications with the woman, but primarily, what is this thing about? It's about the child. I mean, that's what they came together for and had intimacy. That's why she became pregnant to have a child. So watch this. Don't get so about you in this process, this pressure. Don't make it about you. 
Because it's not about you. It's about what God's trying to birth through you for other people, which is his kingdom. See, we're, 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 there is such a narcissism in the church today. It's everything's about me. And God, you're not doing this. Look what you're doing to me. Look what you're doing to me. I don't have this. I don't have that. And it's a total ego. It's a spiritual ego. It's narcissism. And the church um, produces that by these kinds of messages you hear. that it's, They make it all about you. It's not. The thing you're carrying is not just so you be a good person who has money and who can have some fame and get some stuff done so that when you get to heaven, God says, well done, good and faithful servant. Really? That's what it's about? So, and I've heard when people say this. I just, when I get to heaven, I just want to hear God say, good, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm not saying you won't hear that, but is that your motive? Or should you be doing this stuff to be a blessing to all the families of the earth? You doing it for rewards? I didn't do it because I love you. I did it because I want that reward for doing that. Well, your reward is that you've got something down here, some applause from people. That's your reward. Your reward up there is not going to be that. So you gotta, you got to understand. When you, what, it's, get yourself out of yourself. And say, wait a minute. This thing I'm carrying, it's about... The th the, it's about the thing I'm carrying. It's not about me. It's about what it's going to produce in the lives of God's people in the kingdom because that's what it's about. Jesus said if the, if the wheat uh, that falls, the kernel of wheat that falls to the ground, if it does not die, it, bears, it, it stays alone. But if it dies, it bears fruit. So it's not about me. If it's just about me, then I'll just go be happy somewhere, make some money and have a little bit of fame and fortune and leave it alone. No, it's about what God does in me and through me that becomes a blessing to other people so they themselves can, take, can receive from it and be a blessing to other people and pass it on and on and be a blessing. And the kingdom growing at that point as well. So it's not about you. And that, that takes the pressure off. If it doesn't take the pressure off, then you're still a narcissist. You think it's all about you. When in fact, this is how I see it. God, you called me into this world. And so it's up to you. You're the potter. I'm the clay. Whatever you're doing is not about me. It's about you. Because the clay has no say. If it was about you, you'd have some say. But it says, according to what is in the mind of the potter, is what he's doing here. And so I'm saying, I don't like the pressure. I don't like the timing. I don't like the whole thing I'm in. But I know that if I really believe the Bible and tr entrust myself to you, that it will be okay with what's happening. And I'll see this as I'm giving birth to something that's bigger than me. It's going to be a blessing to other people and it's going to advance your kingdom because it's not about me. So I'm not going to personalize this pain because it's not about me. In fact, I'm going to embrace this pain and use it to, bring, to, to get me out of my comfort zone to bring forth something in this world that you can't do with anybody else. You understand? You, you're not here as a, as a duplicate of somebody else. Then you're not, if, if you and somebody else got the same thing going on, one of you don't need to be. Right? And then God just is about making you know, cookie-cutter Christians. God's not, no, every person he considers the frame. He knows the number of hair on their head. He, he, all this stuff. He's got, I mean, the fact that none of us have the same um, fingerprint means that none of us has the same destiny. So what you can give to this world is so unique, and you've got to believe that. See, one of the bad things about <laughs> socialism is you're just another number, another brick in the wall. You don't have any, you're just like everybody else, where a, a free society, you can be your own individual. And you can make a difference. And what I'm saying is that's the way the kingdom is. That God's created you to do something in the kingdom that nobody else was ever designed to do. So see your pain, your suffering, the pressure, the time, all that stuff as the ingredients that's going to put you in the place you need to be to express that uniqueness God called you to be. And that you're in hiding. Look at it. I'm in hiding being molded. And one day there'll be an unveiling. But when that unveiling happens, it'll be due to the pressure, the timing, the education, all. Take the time to learn. Be a learner during this season of waiting and enduring and pressure. Learn every single thing you can. 
during this time. Don't sit in front of the TV and let time pass away. Get, get, get into the Word. Hear the Spirit. Find out what God's saying in this season that you're in. That's just only going to prepare you more for the thing when it comes. If you really want the thing you want, okay, you know what your dream is. If you really, really want it, start preparing for it now by learning and waiting and hearing so that when the thing comes, you'll be able to utilize it at its fullest and bring glory to God <coughs> for whatever the purpose is. Now, if it's all about you, I doubt that's going to be a dream that's going to come fulfilled unless you are all about you and not God, and then you'll be a narcissist and it will be all about you, and God will let you let it be all about you, but you'll get no rewards in heaven, and you'll make no impact in the kingdom. It'll all be about you, the world, the flesh, and believe me, the devil will utilize your narcissism for his own benefit. Hmm? So don't fear the process. It's in the process of time that he will build you, mold you, shape you for what he has for you. Amen? Let's stand. Every one of us, God, is on your will. You, you are individually. You don't have workers. I'm not in the hands of angels because you're too busy and there's too many of us down here for you to do it. So you've got angels molding us. No, 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 no. You, because you're God, we can't comprehend that concept. But every single one of us has your personal attention. So what I want you to see for the year of 2014 is that God has you in His hands. He has per he, and you've got His personal attention. If you have a problem with a particular business, you don't want to talk to the, to the waiter. You want to talk to the bus boy. You don't want to talk to the janitor. You want to talk to the man who owns the business. You want Him to take, to give attention to your plight. Well, you got God's attention. I don't know how much more attention you can get from God when He says, I have you in the palm of my hand. I've inscribed you in the palm of my hand. And the work, you being the clay, me being the potter, you're in my hands. Your life, according to Colossians 1, is hidden in me. We live and act. We live and move and have our being in Him. We're in Him. He is in us. And we're one with Him. You cannot get any more personal attention from God than what Christ did for you through the cross. And he tells me in Hebrews 13, he's not, as a potter, he's not going to let loose the grip he has on me, but will accomplish the work he is. He who began a good work, Philippians 1 6, will bring it to completion. So let the pressure, see the pressure, endure the pressure as part of the process of God giving birth to something. This may be another year of pressure. I don't know. This may be the year you do give birth to the thing that God has placed within you. I don't know. But don't get caught up in timing. Time. Get caught up in timing. Don't see this, oh, this is another year. No, no, this is timing. If it doesn't come this year, it's because there's more that God needs to accomplish in me and in my situations and circumstances. He's still setting me up. He's never let me go. He didn't stop the work. I'm still in the process of manifesting this thing. That gives you hope. And that should never let, pressure should never ever again, if you grab this message like you're supposed to and hear it the way you're supposed to hear it, pressure will never ever defeat you again. Pain and suffering will not cause you to fold, but now you'll understand, no, no, no. I have to endure this in order to give birth to this thing I'm carrying. In fact, God will use it to put me where I need to be. This pressure may be meant for evil, you got to look at the story of Joseph. Those boys meant it for evil, but they were setting Joseph up for his divine appointment. You couldn't convince Joseph of that while he's in the pit. And I'm sure I can't convince you right now if you're in a pit that this is a divine setup because God can use it for his glory. But that's how you've got to see pressure. It may be met by the enemy, but God's going to turn it around and make my pressure that a divine setup that will usher in the very thing I'm looking for God to do. There are no wasted years. If they're wasted, you wasted them because you didn't have eyes to see and ears to hear what God was doing. You did not have the right set of lens on, and that year you folded. And 
And I'm telling you, we can't not let another year go by when we get fold. We, we fold up because of the pressure. Because we're not, we're only going to make the process longer. If I, if I waste a year, I have just made the process longer. How bad do you want this thing to happen and the suddenness of God to happen is just stick with the program. The minute you fold, you go to Egypt. And Abraham cannot give birth to Isaac if he's living in Egypt. He's got to work out his problems in Egypt and get his head on straight and then get back to Canaan where he's going to give birth to something. He's not going to give birth in Egypt. He's only going to give birth to the things of God in Canaan. So you can go ahead and fold up this year. You can get depressed, discouraged, and just give up. But let me let you know that means you're still in Egypt and you're never going to give birth to the thing in Egypt. Get it right. Understand that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. So therefore, stay in Canaan. Stay in the Spirit. Stay within the promise. Learn as much as you can through the process. You're on the wheel. And it's in God's timing, quit looking at time. Start looking at timing. It's not about time. It's about timing. And I promise you, God promises you, you will give birth. God will take you deeper. God will take you higher. You will get into the places that God has prepared for you with no delay. So God, this morning I ask one simple prayer. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your Spirit has taught us this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.